All right, good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning. And uh, because the tomb is empty, our hearts are full. If, uh, if the tomb were not empty, our hearts would be. So it's good to gather again on a Sunday morning. Good to be with God's people. And today is a special treat for equipping hour. Uh, my good friend Chaz Morse from Institute of Creation Research is here with us. And uh, we like to have our creation refresher every once in a while. And uh, Chaz is here to serve us. He's going to serve us well. Uh, he's going to be here tomorrow evening on campus. And all of you are invited to uh, a little kind of update on what ICR is doing uh, with Chaz tomorrow evening. I'll say more about that during the main service. But uh, Chaz, we want to give you all of 58 minutes and 42 seconds. So uh, come share with us, brother. Thank you, Smedley. Uh, does everyone hear me? Do I have this on? How is this? All right. Thank you. We'll put this over here. I got off the plane yesterday from Dallas, Texas, and um, it was 107 there yesterday. But the humidity there is a lot higher, too. So when I got off the plane, it felt more comfortable here. At 100, and what was the temperature yesterday? 100 and what? 100, yeah. So it, it is, you know, they say it's a dry heat. Remember you hear, hear that? Oh, it's hot, but it's a dry. Well, that really does make a difference when, when you're not in, in, um, in Dallas, Texas. So we are, we've had like a gazillion days at above 100, and we're going to have a gazillion more, and everyone is uh, really concerned about the heat, but um, I'm glad to be here in refreshing Tempe, Arizona. <laughs> My name is Chaz. Uh, um, tomorrow night, meet and greet. Uh, it'll be from 7 to 8. I, I will get you, we'll do, be in the question time at 8 o'clock, but you're going to hear from Dr. Galus, our president, uh, our uh, chairman of, of the elder or, elder or, the, de, or the trustee board, uh, General Mark Shackelford. And then also you're going to hear from our chief scientists on the research that we're doing right now. And I will tell you, it is exciting um, uh, to be at ICR right now. We're doing research that's being done nowhere else on the face of this earth to show um, the fact that we are created to fill, to multiply, and uh, to be fruitful uh, on this earth. And so we're going to bring that out. Our research bears it, and it affirms the things that we see in God's Word. So come tomorrow night, and you will really uh, appreciate that. What's also cool is we're having a, a mega conference here in October and uh, it's going to be at uh, Tri-City Baptist Church in Chandler. And uh, I would really invite all of you to be a part of that. Um, we're going to have the um, Babylon B uh, head there along with Dr. Galusa and, uh, and Jeff Williams, a NASA astronaut. Jeff is also on the board of uh, trustees at the Institute for Creation Research. So just to let you know, we have some, some incredible men that are leading this organization but we're going to have a, a, a mega conference, and what's going to be included in that mega conference is kind of cool. We're going to have we're going to bring all our dinosaurs out. We're, they're going to have a family night, um, and you are going to hear some incredible messages. So I'd really encourage you to sign up for that. Um, it's on our website, and it's um, uh, identified. I have some brochures too on the back uh, that um, will talk about that. So. Um, let's open in a word of prayer. Does Genesis matter? And that's the topic that we'll be talking about in the next 55 minutes because I turn into a pumpkin at 10 o'clock. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for uh, this fellowship of, of believers who, who love your word. Uh, they love the, the perspicuity of, of, of your written word, the clarity, and, and how it, it, it leads us on in our sanctification. It's a hard life that we live here, and yet we have your word, and it can be trusted in all the way from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to the end of Revelation. And so I just pray that uh, I would be clear and concise. I pray, Father, for the next uh, hour. I pray that uh, the, the theme would, would be so clear that uh, your word uh, can be trusted, and it can be understood just as it is written. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 
why am I here at ICR? My dad used to be um, a rocket scientist, a Boston, MIT grad, uh, moved out to Southern California during uh, Kennedy's program to put man on the earth. And so he came to Southern California. He also came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And one of the things that my dad was really perplexed with is, is all this evolution stuff that he had been taught in school all the way up. And how do I, how do I deconflict what I'm, what my son, what, what, science was telling me and what's in the Word of God. And he went down to San Diego and spent time with Dr. Henry Morris, our, our organization's founder. And my dad came back and said, this is so cool. The science that I was learning all the way up through my educational process was not really science. It was an ideology that basically had pushed God out of the equation. And he was really learning junk science or, or um, bad science and not true science. And so um, he became a, a spokesperson for ICR. And in the 1970s, during the Jesus movement, um, the other thing that was really big, a big watershed event where people were getting back into the Word of God. And so he would fill auditoriums with people who, here's a scientist, and he takes the first you know, chapters of Genesis literally. And so he needed someone to operate his, his, his AV, his carousel slide projector. And for those of you who don't know what that is, you're making me feel even older than I am. It's a carousel. How many people know what a carousel slide projector? Okay, the rest of you, Google it on your phone. Uh, but anyway, so I operated. So he was pulling me around California, um, uh, bribing me with Jack in the Box burgers and milkshakes, you know, till one in the morning. We was debating and, and, and speaking at churches, and it was really cool. So that's how I was pulled into the whole creation thing. So that's why I'm here at ICR. So um, he actually was uh, mentioned in the first publication, Acts and Facts, of the second paragraph, which, of course, you can't read. It says, the center sponsored research by Charles P. Morse, M-O-R-S-E. That's really how you, you know, spell Morse, not Morse. No, I'm just joking. It's Morse, my, my last name. Mathematician and engineer on the source of the water and the driving energy of the flood. So my dad spent 10 years um, doing that. He got laid off as a NASA astronaut, and so for the next 10 years, he was uh, serving as a scientist for the Institute for Creation Research. So really, that's why I'm here. Um, why are you here? Well, it's Sunday morning. Oh, oh rats. Uh, we got a guest speaker today. Rats. We're not going to have the normal. No, I'm just joking. Um, why are you here? And I, and I think you were all interested in knowing you know, what the Bible says about creation, not just you know what it says, but how important it is and integral to the message of the Bible. So uh, last year I was out, my patty, uh, when she was still alive, she got the, you know, you go to Costco and you get a gallon of mayonnaise. Well, she got like a 10 pound container of salt. You know, so I'm out there, you know, salting my steaks, you know, barbecuing. And all of a sudden I looked on the lid and there was a message on, on, on the lid. And of course, I don't know if you can read it, but the, these salt manufacturers, wherever they're at, probably China, right? Um, they, they tell me that this salt was mined deep in the Himalayan, but it was formed during the Jurassic era 250 million years ago. How do the salt people know that? You know, I mean, are they, you know, scientists? Are they geologists? And, and so that's why you're here. It's like we turn on the TV. We, we read the Wall Street Journal. We, we talk to people at the water cooler. And if we mention anything less than millions of years for the orge, they think we are crazy. You know, and when we're talking days or 6,000 years, they think, where have you come from? You know, you must be those people that believe in a flat earth. And we're not going to talk about flat earth today. Um, we always get those questions as well. And there's a whole group of people that believe in a flat earth. And they equate that with people who believe in a literal Bible and that it's just totally, completely different. But the point I'm making is, is that it's everywhere. It's saturated our culture. It, you know, you can't take Grudem's systematic theology and you open it up and you have to avoid sections in that because he's even been influenced by evolutionary thought, millions and millions of years. The ge geologic table, that could never have occurred from a flood, he says in his systematic theology. So it, it's affected all of us, and I think we've all been brainwashed to a certain level about um, really compromising the word of God. Uh, by the way, you flip that container over, and I have this 250 million year old salt, and it has a shelf life of one year. Something's, <laughs> something, something is definitely wrong. Mercy. Here's our overall objective. Um, 
to, to really present the, the biblical narrative and accept the sixth day of creation as history and essential doctrine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Those are two key words, history and, and essential. It's not a secondary idea, something that we can shove. And we're also hearing that from the, the, the evangelical community and even uh, teachers that, that teach at Christian colleges or seminaries. They say, well, creation is really not that important. Don't worry about it. You know, you can skip the first, you, know, you land where Abraham is and then you can go forward. And, and that's, that's our objective to show it's history and essential. We have certain goals, too, to increase your confidence, discover the importance of embracing a biblical creation worldview, uh, to demonstrate how an understanding of current scientific research affirms the things we see in God's Word. That's going to be tomorrow night. And I think you're going to be really challenged if you come back to see this exciting stuff that I said before. And, and what does the science say about, about the Word of God? And then to acknowledge the implications for the believer. That's the most important, right? I mean, why do we study creation? Because it should lead us to understand certain things about the God uh, that we serve. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. And I, I want you to understand that with ICR, we, we start with the Bible. We look at creation through the lens of Scripture. So it's not like we, we elevate science and say, well, if we can prove something scientifically, we'll believe in the Word of God. No, we start with the Word of God, and then in a cursed creation, there are going to be things that will affirm the things we see in the Word, but, but the Word never genuflects, if you will, to science. Look at this in, in Psalm 33. Sing for joy in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre and sing praises to him with the harp of ten strings. They're getting ready to worship, right? In the temple. So let's break out the choir. Let's break out all the instruments. Let's tune everything so we can praise God, right? And, and look at verse 6. What are we going to sing about? Look at verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Wow. It, it, in, that first, in that verse 6, we, le we learn that God made the heavens and the earth. What is, what is this psalm reverting back to? Genesis chapter 1. And then he's also telling us how he made the creation. He spoke it into existence. He gathers the waters of the sea together. He lays up the deeps and storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord and let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And there's going to be a theme you're going to see today, and we'll conclude if I have enough time at 10 o'clock. But we're going to include, you're, you're always going to see a correlation. When you're studying the Word, and when you want to study creation for yourself, you're always going to see creation mentioned as a cable going through the entire Word of God. But it's always going to be associated with deliverance. And that's the, if God is our creator, if he controls the entire universe, if he controls every electron that's spinning, that there's nothing that goes undetected, if he's the creator, how hard is it for him to take care of all of the individual problems you might have in your life, right? Look down in that Psalm 33, my, in verse 18, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. Let's say the creator of the universe who made you, who made everything that's in existence, has his eyes on those who fear him. If you're in Christ Jesus today, that's you. On those who hope for his steadfast love to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. See the deliverance? Whenever you see creation, you hunt somewhere. Down the verses, you're going to see deliverance. There's that correlation, which is really incredible. And so that's, a, that's really important. It's really important. Now, now we, we submit to Yahweh. He's creator. Uh, why? Because he used natural processes over millions of years? Or because he used mutations and death and destruction? Because he used time and chaos and mistakes to form his creation? Or he used a big bang uh, and destruction to form what we see in this world today? No. Uh, the psalm is reinforcing the fact that in the beginning, God created, spoke into existence, spoke out of nothing the heavens and the earth. For he spoke, verse 9, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. I mean, that's pretty definitive, isn't it? And, it, and we don't see it just there. We see it in many, many other verses. And so, you know, that's why Genesis matters. That's the overall, really, theme of, and so we, I have, this is like a seven part, seven messages. So we're just going to be doing the introduction today. 
and, and, and the main point. Uh, why is it important to believe in a, in a, in a, in a literal creation? So this is part of the uh, introduction. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of things, questions. So, uh, we're going to first see what is, isn't biblical creation. It's, it's really easy sometimes for us to understand what it is if we understand what it isn't. So um, I'm going to basically describe what biblical creation isn't, and then we're going to define what it is, and then we're going to really ask the question, is it an essential doctrine? Is it historical? Is it something that we can trust in? And then some implications, and then we'll go on to um, the next section. Interesting doctor in the turn of the century, Dr. Ernst Haeckel. And uh, he is actually Ernst Heinrich Philip August Haeckel. How would you like to have a name like that? I have a hard time memorizing people's first names. So you look at that. But he was a German zoologist, and he lived uh, in the 1800s. He was a naturalist. He was a philosopher, a physician, a professor, a marine biologist, and an and, and artist. He was just an uh, incredibly um, learned man, but he was steeped in the evolutionary theory. And, and Robert R Richard says this about him. He says, more people at the turn of the century learned of the evolutionary theory from his pen uh, Hegel's pen than from any other source, including Darwin. He was in Germany. Um, he was also regarded, Roberts goes on, uh, as a complicit in, na in Nazi biology. And, and despite isolated attempts to deny that, the implications were so profound. In fact, Hegel speculated uh, as, uh, as a man, he admitted that the earth, still in its own time, his own time while he was living, was populated by several human races so different from one another that they may be even considered to be different in a species position in, in the chart. So you can see where the racism comes or the implications of that. And later on, the German um, military, Hitler, used that, of course, to eradicate people that they thought were less than human based on this, uh, this, this, um, this philosophy or ide ideology. But anyway, he said this um, about the church. Hegel said this about the church. I'll read it to you. Our science of evolution won its greatest triumph when at the beginning of the 20th century, its powerful opponents, the churches, became reconciled to it. Can you listen to that? It was powerful opponents, the church. Up until the 1800s, you had a study Bible or a Danish study Bible or a lot of the study Bibles that were produced earlier on. You would read Genesis 1 and 2 and there was no gap, there was no day age theory, there was no um, capitulation, if you will, um, for anything other than these were little literal days and everything. But when Darwinism came, the church capitulated and became reconciled to the evolutionary theory and endeavored to bring their dogmas in line with that. So, I, I mean, I went through Dallas Theological Seminary uh, way back in the 80s, and, you, and, there's, and most of the professors had bought into the gap theory, the day-age theory. They had capitulated because of some form of Darwinism had been laid against uh, the, the template of Genesis chapter 1. And that's exactly what, 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 what Hegel, the atheist, is, is saying right here. So, um, let's talk about what biblical creation isn't, okay? And, and that'll, that'll kind of help us get through the whole thing. And first of all, it's not nature's substitute for the creator. It's not natural selection. You see, when natural selection was, was postulated, it was a way in which Darwin could take the creator God out of the universe and just look at natural processes to be able to um, be accounted for um, the evolution of man, that we didn't need to bow to a creator. But that's what biblical creation isn't. Um, it doesn't use death as its major component. Uh, biblical creation has nothing to do with death, and yet natural selection, it really when it boils down to it, death is really the God that, that's worshipped, and death basically eliminates the the lesser organisms, the ones that can't survive, and it promotes the ones that can. That's, that's, that's really natural selection speaking. Um, biblical creation doesn't deal with mutations. Mutations are mistakes. 
And, and given you know, enough time, the hope is, is that these mistakes sometimes would be good mistakes and that um, an organism actually could, could grow up to be a more fit, if you will. But that's not biblical creation. And then biblical creation uh, doesn't take excessive time. It, 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 it's, it's instantaneous. It's, uh, the, the creative act in Genesis chapter one is something God spoke and it occurred. It's a, it's a miracle. So the bottom line in all of this is, is that um, biblical creation is not another name for natural selection or theistic um, selection, selections, <laughs> selectionism. And so that's really what, what it isn't. Um, a few more things on, on, on natural selection. Uh, this is what Darwin says about natural selection. He says you have the survival of the fittest. The, sec- the last line says preservation of favorable ver- uh, variations and the rejection or the death, if you want to put it bluntly, of injurious variations. That's what natural selection is. And um, the next author says this about Darwin. He says it was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the complex organization of living beings can be explained by natural selection and, and, and its influence today uh, in the church. Um, and that's, that's really what these quotes are saying. Uh, another uh, author in, in really talking about Darwin, Darwin's discovery of natural selection, the origin of organisms were brought into the realm of science. And, and as a result, natural processes without recourse to an intelligent designer. In other words, you don't need God. And, and, and when you embrace natural selection, you're basically saying, God, you're not needed. It's clockwork orange. You know, he, he winds up the clock, walks away, and it's natural selection that's doing all of the, the, the processes. And that's exactly what biblical creation isn't. Uh, Greg Graffin um, wrote an article in Nature Magazine, and I'm sorry, Scientific American. Uh, the article was Darwin was a punk is, is the name of the um, article. But he says right here, the trick is, how do you talk about natural selection without implying the rigidity of law? And we use it as an active participant like a god. So he's basically, and this is this not a creationist, but what he's saying is that natural selection becomes a god in place of um, an intelligent designer. And that's what he's saying about that. Um, another um, uh, atheist evolutionist, uh, Kaufman, says this, Biolog- uh, biologists now tend to believe that natural selection is the invisible hand that crafts well-wrought forms. And he ends by saying, if current biology has a central canon, and this sounds like church, you have now heard about it, and that's natural selection. And, and another uh, biologist, uh, Reed, says this, little wonder creationists find it such an easy mark, but they and selectionists have this in common. Faith is really the foundation of what they believe in, and, and that's a given. We, we believe, uh, you, you know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, by faith we believe that the worlds were created out of the things that are not seen. And that's where we begin. But those who embrace natural selection need to realize that it's the same thing because natural selection has not been verified in a laboratory. It's not scientific. It was proposed because they didn't want God in the picture. So that's what it um, isn't. And here's another quote, but we won't talk about it now. But, but what is uh, biblical creation? What, what is it? Well, first of all, the source is the Trinity. Do you realize that God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were involved in the creative uh, processes that occurred in Genesis chapter 1? Um, we don't have time to talk about the Trinity in creation, but it's just marvelous. I mean, in seminary, we did a whole um, couple of sessions on the Trinity uh, in creation. Uh, the work of creation, it wasn't distributed like, okay, son, you go out and do your thing, and me, the Father, I'll do my thing, and the Holy Spirit does. No, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but, but they work together in essence with each other. Uh, the source is the Trinity. He created all things. Um, it begins with each person of the Trinity acting in concert with the other two persons. Uh, God the Father is the source. God the Son is the means. And God the Holy Spirit is the agent. You know what's really cool about this, and we don't have time to, but think about the fact that the work week was established, right? Day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, rest day. Do you realize that the first person who worked, the Trinity, 
Isn't that cool? And so even, that's even before sin. And so work was something that was designed, that was given to Adam, and it was exemplified in the way the Creator God orchestrated the first week of creation. So the first work that was done in the universe was done by the Trinity. Isn't that marvelous? I think that's just amazing. So when you go to work tomorrow, realize that it's not a curse, that we'll be working with our glorified bodies in the future. So it's just the fact that we're working right now, as Solomon says, vanity, vanity, and we're working in a cursed creation and all that other stuff. But we're going to be in, a, in, a, in an environment one day where we're not under the, the curse of creation. I'm looking forward to that. Are you? Well, this isn't a topic on, on the Trinity, but it, it begs to be mentioned. Uh, miracles. Um, biblical creation is supernatural. It's, 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 it's a miracle. Uh, Lazarus, come forward. Remember when Christ raised Lazarus, right? Uh, how can we actually take the doctors now and examine Lazarus? You know, take his, let's take a sample of his blood. Let's, let's look at his lungs. Let's x-ray him. Let's look at his brain. Are they going to be able to recreate what, what happened when Jesus just spoke Lazarus alive? The answer is no. And that's the same way with science and creation. We can't go back and recreate the first six days of creation. But certainly we can look at today's creation and see glimpses of the fact that it, it's a young earth. And that's exactly the way ICR is here. We, we see biologic material in, in, in fossils that are supposed to be 150 and 200 million years old. We see a geologic um, layers that were laid down very quickly. These are all evidences of the record that was recorded by Moses under the control of the Holy Spirit, but supernatural. In six days, well, actually, we'll talk about ex nihilo, um, no pre-existing ingredients. So a big bang has pre-existing ingredients, but God says he spoke it out of nothing. And then, of course, the last thing is that it was um, six days. And we're going to talk about days for a little bit because it's important for us to know that. Um, Genesis chapter 1, if you're still in it, is really important uh, for us if you want to open it up. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. It's interesting that um, we have another individual, again, who was... Um, an atheist, a naturalist, and that was uh, Herbert Spencer. Uh, Spencer said that everything fits into one of these categories, time, force, action, space, and matter. Now, he was an evolutionist, but he said he was noted really for saying that everything in the, that we see in the universe can be categorized. The, all the categories of knowledge are those five things that I just mentioned. Um, that's time, force, action, space and matter. So think about this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning is what? Oh, I have it up there. Time. Um, God is a force, right? A personal force described in the word. But, but uh, he created what? Creating is energy. And what did he create? He created the heavens, which is space. And what else? the earth, and the earth is also matter. And so it's interesting that we have the secularist, this guy who says, okay, in, it has to be in that order, and, and, and it, this basically involves all of, the, all of reality and the knowledgeable, and yet we have in the first 10 words of the Hebrew Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Isn't that amazing? And so there's a clarity, an acuity, there's a, a perspicuity, and we'll talk about that word, that, uh, that, that God, through the control of the Holy Spirit, Moses writing these words, it wasn't just some ignoramus writing, but, but, but Moses basically took these thoughts, however the Holy Spirit moved him, and, and we have something that we can trust in that's, that, that's full of meaning, and, and, and your pastor unpacks each and every week, you know, the, the jewels that are in God's word, but it begins with Genesis chapter one. There's a, a pure, clear reading. If you just read the word of God, you know, you have day one, day two, three, four, five, and six, and six is really divided into two parts. It's really interesting, and in, in Genesis 1.26, let's get back to the Trinity, God basically stops. He's created everything in the universe, and what does he do? He's, he has this conversation with himself. Let us make what? Man in our image. Isn't that amazing? So there's even a pause. So there's a, a pause between the animals and, and man. And, and who is God having this conversation with? Himself. It's not the angels. 
It's, he's not just like you and I having a conversation. We'll say, I forgot this. Uh, now I need to go to the store. And you're it's not that. He's having a, a conversation, and that's Trinitarian when you take the rest of the word and, and put it back on this passage. It's just amazing. But if you look at the, the science, the, the ideology of today, it believes there's a big bang. And, and we have billions of years, the stars. And then we have this hot, hot um, earth. It's just hot, molten ball, a, a rock. It's even hotter than Tempe, Arizona in the middle of summer. And there's no water in it, right? And, and then, of course, this molten lava dis, dissipates and then water. But, but what does God start with? He, he starts with a ball and it's covered with what? Water. So God begins with the water, and then he divides it, uh, you know, the firmament below, above, and then, but it's completely opposite. So you can't even take the secular approach to evolution and even overlay that with the text in Genesis without the passage screaming. He created everything and in six days. And in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. That's clearly, clearly articulated. And that's Genesis 1. And, and I love this, because you can go back through first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, and, and there's this acuity, uh, and it tells us exactly, exactly how he did it. And this is what uh, Van Dam uh, basically, there's a new book out. Actually, it's a year old. But it's uh, called In the Beginning by um, Dr. Cornelius Van Dam. And I recommend all of you reading it. It's just incredible. I, after I wrote, I took a day. I just took a day off from work. And, you know, you like to read. And I just, I, I turned off my phone and everything. And I read through this book. And I thought, okay, this he's going to talk about, you know, evolution, millions of years. But this reformed professor at a, at a reformed theological seminary in Canada says, look guys, and this is why he wrote it, we need to be serious with Genesis. You know, we reformed guys can, are just basically bowing and genuflecting to the evolution of the day. And the Hebrew won't let us. And that's what this book is all about. It's a cool book. And, um, but he says like this, and, he's, and then he takes it apart, the unity of the Bible, the literal days. I'm going to share some of that with you today. But he says, really, by and large, grammatically, textually, and contextually speaking, it is difficult to evade the force of the text is simply referring to day as a term that's customarily used. Indeed, on this point, there is near unanimity among the current scholars, liberal and conservative, that you just got to take a day and, and, and treat it as a literal day. And it's more honest to say, you know, I know what he says, but I don't agree with it. You know, uh, Moses was on drugs. Moses was an ignoramus. Moses didn't know what he was talking about. He, he meant days. He meant 24-hour days, but I don't buy into it. That's really what, what Van Dam is saying here. You either embrace it or, or, or you, you reject it. And he goes on, I mean, in his book and many other books, that when you add day with a number, you're really locked into uh, a literal day. The day of the Lord can be a long period of time, right? When we're talking about the tribulation, we're talking about the second coming of Christ. And the day of the Lord, in that, in that way, the day is, 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 is a very, very broad term. But as soon as, like when I say I'm blue, um, you know that I'm not blue right now. So, you, well, is this blue? I'm colorblind. It's black. If I say I'm blue, you know, well, my shirt's blue. But if I, if I say I'm blue, you think you're probably, you know, that um, I'm, I'm down and I'm depressed and I'm lowly. But if I say the shirt is blue, you know that I've taken that, that word and then defined it by, by my shirt. Or that gentleman in the back, he has a really nice dark blue shirt. I, I'd like to have that one. But I like blue. But, but you know, so words have their meaning, but it's the context that determines how you define that word. And it's the same with gnome. I could, I could tell you, well, gnome means a thousand years, or it means, you know, seven periods of tribulation or years in the context that's being used. But in the context of being used when it's relationship to creation, uh, you have nothing, no, no really skosh there but a 24-hour day. And then Moses wrote Exodus chapter 20, so he's plagiarizing himself, and he says, okay, what I told you back in Genesis chapter 1 
about day one, two, three, four, five, and that God rested on the seventh day, he says, then I want you to behave that way in your worship. So, of course, it was a Jewish seventh day. It was Saturday. It was yesterday. But I want you to behave yourself. And then he had all the rules and regulations of what you can't do on the Sabbath day. But he says the reason why we do that is God rested. And when we do it for a 24-hour period, because it was a 24-hour period, and he quotes Genesis chapter 1, meaning that he had the same meaning on both contexts. So, I mean, the, when you use the scripture to find the scripture, it's pretty, pretty apparent. And then if you look at the word, use of day with numbers, with uh, sunset, sunrise, and everything. In every instance, it's a 24-hour period of time. I just don't want to beat this to a death, but it's just, you just don't have that skosh. And so then, what about all these other reformers? And, and you have, of course, Luther um, talking about uh, Augustine. And I'm going to have to read it here because my eyes are really bad. Augustine uses creation as a springboard to launch various erroneous allegoric teaching. And so I think we're plagued with that in the church today. The, the Greek philosophy of the day would allegorize. And so some of the early church fathers said, hey, no, this is cool. Let's take that, that paradigm, that, that hermeneutical principle, and let's apply it to the flood. And maybe we can extract some hidden meaning, some hidden spiritual meaning. That's where all that came from. I mean, we have pastors doing that today. Uh, but that's where it came from. This is not new under the sun. And so Luther said, um, he went on to say, as far as this opinion of Augustine is concerned, we have said that Moses spoke in the literal sense. He's saying Augustine was wrong. And he said, if we do not comprehend the reason for literal days, or if our science is telling us something different, we should just uh, remain pupils and leave the job of the teacher to the Holy Spirit. That's kind of a rebuke. Because basically we're telling the Holy Spirit that he doesn't know what he's talking about when we try to change the text. He goes on. Um, and then if we do not understand the nature of the days or have insight into why God wanted to make the use of these intervals of time, let us confess our lack, our lack of understanding rather than distort the words contrary to the context in which is the foreign meaning. I love that. I, I, did a, I read... Um, Luther did a whole commentary in the book of Genesis, and I have all the books. It's just incredible. And he understood the importance of beginning uh, in Genesis. So um, we looked at what biblical creation isn't, right? And then we looked at it, what it is. And, and I had to go through quickly, but you get the idea. They're diametrically opposed, and you can't mix the two, naturalism or biblical creation. Um, is it essential or is it historical? Is it something that we can really trust in um, historically? And I love this little book. Um, how many of you have read Martin Lloyd-Jones' different books? I, I know he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a, a rock star here in this congregation. Well, I was reading this thing as what is an evang evangelical? And, and so, I mean, it had nothing to do with creation. I got in the middle of the book, and guess what he says? He says, the gospel begins with creation, and here's this reform guy and, 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 and just one of the best uh, expositors or preachers at the turn of the century. And he basically is saying that you begin um, with creation when you're proclaiming the gospel. I'll, I'll give you a couple of quotes. It's kind of cool. And he's talking about the essential nature of creation and the essential nature of um, historical data. And this is essential versus non-essential. You know, we have to draw a basic distinction between truths and doctrines which we is, insist are essential or foundational and other doctrines which aren't foundational and, 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 and a difference of, of quality, if you will. It's all God's word, but some truth in God's word is more important than, than another truth, right? When I'm witnessing to someone, I, I go right to John 3.16, jugular. I'll begin with creation. You're a sinner. Um, Jesus Christ isn't, you get to the gospel. And, and so there's certain portions of scripture that are much more important to bringing someone to Christ. But there are other texts that are foundational that are just as important and needed in that discussion. And that's exactly what he's saying here. And, and so you would think at this point, he says, okay, well, creation is not important. It's a secondary issue. It's one of those things that we can ignore and we don't need to worry about that. But then he comes on and says the history of the Old Testament 
especially is essential and we need to pay attention to it. And he goes in specifics in another book and says the first three books of Genesis is so important and integral to the gospel of Christ. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He says that Bible and science, we must assert the historicity of these manifestations of the supernatural. And we must believe the history of the Bible as well as its didactic teaching. Today there are men who say, oh yes, we believe in the Bible and its supreme authority in matters of religion, but of course we don't go to the Bible for science. Uh, there's a noted, uh, like Hugh Ross and others saying, well, the Bible doesn't tell us how God created uh, the heavens and the earth. And I go, oh really? I thought I just read that in chapter one. But, but don't buy into that because they'll say that immediately. And if you buy into that, then all of a sudden science, if God didn't tell us how he created the heavens and the earth, you immediately need to, well, then where do I find that information? And, and Dr. Ross and others will tell you, well, we find it in science. And science is what trumps the word. And, and, and these people didn't know. And that's where they go. But you, you never enter that argument because God does tell us not completely how he did it, but we know that there are certain things that he does stress, i.e. Uh, creating things out of nothing and speaking things into creation. And that's exactly what, what he's saying here. So, so I, I don't want to you know, spend too much time here. Uh, suffice to say that, uh, that, that, that creation is, is an essential doctrine to understanding salvation, it's where sin came from, the first three chapters of Genesis, and it's understanding the fact that God created the earth, he saw everything to be good. In the future, he's gonna restore that during the millennium, and then completely sin will be eradicated in the new heavens and the earth. But, but, but this isn't the way he created. What we're experiencing now in this creation wasn't on day one. God saw everything, and he saw it to be very good, and that's what the Bible is, is telling us here. There are unexplained passages, things that are a little bit clear. We use scripture to understand scripture, and Martin Lloyd says all of those things. We did a creation conference at Pastor MacArthur's church a few years back, and this is what he said about um, really uh, biblical creation, and this is what he said about the essentiality of, and the his historicity of, of what the Bible is articulating, and he calls that theology or biblical theology. MacArthur said, theology is used to be called the queen of sciences. It was called the queen of sciences because in the final analysis, the ultimate reigning truth is theology, biblical theology. Uh, the revelation of God in Scripture, it trumps all other sources of information and knowledge. And so for centuries, creation was a theological issue, not, not a scientific one. And as soon as the, the science or the junk science of the 1800s was imposed on the word, we capitulated, and that's where things went, went downhill. And it affects everything that we see in our writings and our systematic theologies and everything else. But it's important to know that they're two separate separate things and we go to the Bible first. What's interesting is God is giving us all sorts of things. And Mount St. Helens exploded in, in, um, when I got married in 1980 in May. And before that, geology was saying as those layers were formed over you know, tens of thousands of years, each layer. You go to the Grand Canyon and you see all those layers. That, that, that's an evidence of, of, of geologic evolution. Well, Mount St. Helens blew. And what it did is it produced the same types of formations that we see in the Grand Canyon, identical. They didn't see it right away. Those were all covered over with ash and everything. And then two years later, when ice had built back up in the volcano, there was a second explosion. Water and mud came down. It carved out canyons and exposed layers that everyone knew were only created in a couple of days. And you could take those layers and that imagery and lay it up against the layers in the Grand Canyon. It was identical. So what I'm saying is that those people back in, in the day of Moses or the people in the first century or who the author of the book of Hebrews was writing to, they didn't have any of the good science now that is pointing back to and affirming the word of God. But they didn't challenge it. They believed it by faith. And that's what we need to do. Creation's not a natural event. It was um, a supernatural event. So these are the implications just from my introduction. Isn't that funny? This is just the introduction. Uh, actually, this is my um, thesis at the Master Seminary. So I had to give a series of presentations. So um, I had to give seven presentations, and I had to do it back to back to back. 
so that I'd have the same, you know, I had an audience about just like this. Poor people had to stay with me an entire Saturday. And we did the introduction, half hour break. Then we did Roman numeral one, you know, uh, uh, the next one, the next one, the next one. And so I did seven presentations until about four or five in the afternoon. And um, so this is just the first introduction, but it's really important for us to lay that down. Uh, so what are the implications? Uh, first of all, understanding the universe's origin is based on God's word, not science. Uh, uh, creation is a, a series of supernatural, instantaneous um, miracles. No natural processes are involved in God's creation. And as believers, we must believe that um, this is historical and essential, that we need the, the, the beginning chapters of Genesis to be able to understand not only um, salvation, but all of the other things, even the um, Psalm 33 that I read to you earlier today. The fact that we have a God that, that, that cares for us. He's, he stoops down and he relates to us, those who fear him and obey his commandments, the redeemed. And, and so we can trust in him. We can go home today and just be assured that, 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 that our God loves us because he is our creator and he knows us. And when the Bible um, and science intersect, there are recent discoveries that affirm the veracity of the word of God. And we'll talk some more of that now. So let's go ahead and, and now go through. We've, we've talked about the introduction. Let's talk about what the Bible says about biblical creation as soon as uh, 15, 14 minutes is up, I'll stop, okay? But if you want me to come back, you know, I can come back and do number two, three, four, five. <laughs> you guys are so patient. But this is a great way of organizing it. So I, uh, I think you'll, you'll enjoy. So, so let's talk about what the Bible says uh, about, about creation. And he, he clearly tells us about how he created and it's interesting, you know, we, it's some of the, the acuity and the clarity is lost in the English language, but when you go back to the Hebrew, it's just fascinating to see uh, chapter, chapter one in that. So we're going we're gonna to take it apart this way, uh, clarity, accuracy, unity, priority, testimony, implications. How does that, does that sound good to you? Okay, good, because if it doesn't, I'm locked into this anyway, so it really doesn't, doesn't matter, and I don't even know why I'm asking the question, but uh, anyway, Clarity. Clarity. Is the Bible clear? Uh, a lot of people say it's ambiguous. It's, it's foggy. It, uh, yeah, the Bible is inspired, but we really can't know what God meant in Genesis chapter, chapter 1. Well, the Reformers said no. That's not true. Um, the perspicuity, those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation historically and essential are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture so not, not only the learned, those are the people with PhDs, not only the learned can understand, but, but the unlearned, people like me, uh, in due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. That was uh, Martin Luther. And that's the word uh, clarity or perspicuity, and that's where we, we, we get that word. So the Bible is not confusing, but, but it's clear. And we have, um, really before we go to the next one, uh, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness, the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I mean, the Bible, when it talks about it, we go to Psalm 119, the middle of your Bible, and you know, in almost every verse, it talks about the, the, the perspicuity, the clarity, the, the importance, the treasure of God's word. And that's, that's what we see there. So uh, accuracy, is the Bible accurate? And, and even uh, Hugh Ross and others will tell you, yeah, it's accurate, but it's, 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 it's not accurate. They'll say it's precise. There's a difference between being precise and accurate, and, and that's what we need to understand. Uh, this chart really shows the difference. So um, low accuracy, low precision, if I was shooting arrows into a target, that, that top left. But the top right shows um, precision, but no accuracy. If you're aiming for the, for the bullseye, you could say, well, Genesis chapter 1 is precise. Moses said days, but he was wrong. He wasn't accurate. He didn't have the science of the day. Um, but if you go to the, 
the bottom right, high accuracy, high precision. You have not only preciseness, but accuracy. It's on the bullseye, and that's what we're saying about God's word, that there's no variance. It's, it is precise, and, and, it, and it's accurate, and it's a really important distinction to make. Let's talk about a little bit about that when it talks about the unity of, of the word of God. We have historical divisions that we find in, in, in Genesis. I'm going to get into the Hebrew a little bit, but it's pretty easy. Now, the Hebrew word to remember is, is toledot. It's the generations of, and you'll see some of that, the, the history of, the, the genealogy, 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 all the way down to chapter 50 of Genesis. Do you realize that these are, how many had an erector set when you were growing up? Now I'm really dating myself. There's only about five people that raise their hands. But it was a, a box, a metal box, and you open it up and it had all these metal parts and had these screws and nuts. And what you do is you, you'd have to tighten the screw and tighten these joints together. Well, that's exactly what this word is doing with the entire text of Genesis. It's connecting the, this section of Scripture with this section of Scripture. And, and a toledot gives you the idea that it looks back and then it looks forward. It takes the implications of what it's just said, and, it, and, and then it goes on to the next section. And, and, and that's what really glues the whole book of Genesis together. So you can't divide verse 1 and 2. You can't say, well, chapter 1 was written by these folks, and, and chapter 2 was written by these folks. Moses basically put this whole thing together, and in the Hebrew, it's very, very, it's like a skeleton, and it's closely connected with the ligaments and everything necessary to connect each of these sections together. So it's organized as a whole, whole book. And um, what's really amazing is this uh, uh, chiastic structure. And a chiasm is really cool. It's like C, A, B, and C. Go to Genesis 2, 4. You have your uh, Bibles open. Go to chapter 2, verse 4. And, and this is a connector. This is the toledot. It's, it's, this is the generation, the toledot of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day the Lord made the earth and, and heavens. See the ABC construction and the CBA? And with the word, so basically the ABC refers to chapter one of Genesis. This is the first Toledot in the book of Genesis. And he's saying, okay, I, I basically gave you an overview of Genesis chapter one all the way to chapter two, verse three. Now I'm gonna, in chapter two, uh, verses five forward, I'm going to tell you exactly the important elements that happened during the creation, including the creation of man and all these particulars. So that's really what's happening here. So you have this, this unity, and, and so you look back, and then you look forward. And I love the construction there even with that. And there's also another thing called, you didn't think this was going to be a Hebrew lesson. It's uh, the, the Vav consecutive. Some people mispronounce and go, walk, consecutive. Anyway, I think it's Vav consecutive. A number of people pronounce it different ways. But these are also connectors. These are and words. Like you see, but, now, then, when, so. Uh, they're found in narrative. And so I uh, ate, uh, let's see, I had Chinese food last night. I ate Chinese food. And then I spent some time in the Word, and I went to bed. Do you see what's happening? I, I'm connecting it. It's sequential. It's narrative. And that's exactly what we see in Genesis. Do you realize there's over 50 of these Vav consecutives in the first three chapters of Genesis? It, it's a time. It's a narrative. It's not poetry. You can't make this text anything but a narrative, a historical narrative. And Moses is very particular about not only the Toledot, but also these connectors. And I, I think this is really important because I think this is really downplayed. A lot of people say, well, you can take the word, you know, for, for, for day, and, and it can, but when you actually add the word for day, the numbers, the rotation of the earth, and then all of this to the text, so you're very locked into just basically saying, okay, either I believe this or I don't. Kaiser says, Moses repeats the Vav consecutive, which is an essential characteristic of the narrative, adding to the past narration an element of sequence, and it helps to identify as such. This really talks about the unity of Genesis. It's consistent with the narrative material found in the remainder of the book of Genesis, and goes on, and you can see these, this narrative all the way down through Joseph and his brothers and, and everything. So this is really, really exciting stuff. 
well, you know what? We're getting to the point where I think we just need to jump right to Nehemiah chapter 8. And I'm going to stop right here. And when I come back, um, uh, Pastor, I will start at this point, okay? So next year, whenever you have me come back, I'll, I'll start with number two. This is really exciting. Remember I told you that it, it, Genesis is everywhere, right? Um, and you say, wow, Chaz, what, why are you in Nehemiah? Well, let's go back to chapter 8. Ezra reads the law. I, I love this chapter. And an expositor, of course, the, the verse that we always go to is, is 7.10. And Ezra explained what, everything about the law to the people. And, and um, it's just a, is it 7.10? Did I get that right? Is it 7.10? I got to put in my heart, nobles, officials. Anyway, um, he's actually explaining to them the, the, the law, and then he goes on. So Ezra reads the law in chapter 8. The people are gathered as one man. And, and so um, they are there. All the people there are going to repent because the wall is being um, basically dedicated. And you have the nation Israel coming back, and they've sinned in a number of different ways. So the law is read. And you think, okay, the law is read. They probably started with Exodus, right? Uh, they, they probably took the scrolls and opened them up. Okay, we're going to start right here, get down to the implication, you know. And so they erect a, a wooden podium, and Ezra gets up there, and he starts reading. the. And he starts early in the morning all the way till noon. He's reading the law. And he does it again after the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and he reads a fourth of the time he's reading the law, and a fourth of the time they're, they're weeping and, and repenting. But what's really incredible is the people confess their sin. Uh, and then look at in chapter 9, verse 5. Then the Levites basically band together and they say, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. So now they're going to, they, they basically, after they're repenting and they're, and they're just wailing for the sin in their life, they, they get to a point where they, let's praise God now. Let's take, let's take time just to praise Yahweh. Uh, because of his steadfast love, the fact that he's gathered us back. But look where he begins in verse 6. You alone are, are Yahweh. Uh, you have made the heavens. Well, where did he get that? Uh, the heaven and the heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to them all, and the heavenly host bows down before you. So right off the bat, what, what are they thinking when that's read? Uh, the law has been read, that, that they began in Genesis chapter 1 when the law was read. And it just kind of stood out to me that even Israel, in the midst of mourning and, and confessing their sin, and when the law is read, they don't start in Exodus, you know, in the second book of the Bible, they start with Genesis 1.1. And, and Moses needs to establish to the people that he's sovereign, that he's Lord, that he's Yahweh, that he created them. Uh, the heavens and the earth, and, the, and we are all needing to be reminded of that. And I think it's just, and then he goes on and talks about how God delivered them in their prayer. So you have that connection between creation and deliverance. We're going to stop right there. Um, I have a, I'm going to have to go through some slides. And um, no, I'm not. This is the morning service. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just real quick, I had um, at the tail end of my slide presentation, if you, put it, if you can put it back up, guys, there's a, it has the acts and facts, and it has a little thing that they can take a picture of. If you're not getting the acts and facts, yeah, please take a picture of that, and then you can sign up for it. It's free uh, magazine. It's incredible, and it has all of the things that we're doing at ICR right now. It's paid for by our donors and we're not going to hound you for money. If, you wanna, if you're not getting the acts and facts in the days of praise, uh, please go ahead and uh, take a picture of that. And tomorrow night, I'll actually have a sign-up sheet, but please know that um, uh, that's available for you so we can continue not only to come here, and we come here about once a year, don't we, uh, Pastor? Um, uh, not only that, but then you can be uh, discipled by us month to month. And we have some really cool kids uh, uh, materials, and we're putting out a book a month, a new book a month right now, our, our communications department. So there are a lot of things going on in ICR that we would really like for you to um, know about. Remember about the Creation Mega Conference that's, that's taking place? And um, I am going to say one more thing. That's my wife, Patty. 
And she's the reason, really, the Lord used her to keep me uh, in this position. And she went home to be with the Lord this time last year. Uh, but she was um, propelling me on in my role at ICR. And so I just kind of wanted to give the Lord credit through her ministry. So she's praising um, the Lord right now along with Matt, Matt Dodd, and, and other of our loved ones. But I just wanted to introduce you to someone who is very special to me and really uh, has actually been used by Lord to shape and, and mold me so that I could give this presentation today. So I just wanted to introduce you to my wife. I, I'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, uh, there's so much uh, in your word, so rich, the jewels, the platinum, the gold, and, and it's easy for us just to listen to the, uh, the, the word speak of the day and, and just uh, and bow to uh, and be intimidated by uh, even um, noted theologians and pastors and, and others, not in this church, but in, in other venues that, that, that doubt your word. And it's so exciting to unpack your word and see the complexity, yet the simplicity of, of what you did in your creation. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that they pack some of these truths away so that they can encourage other believers. And then in their evangelism, use some of these truths, Father, to point people Godward so that they can press on with the gospel of Christ in their presentation. And we thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. And the Lord's people said, amen. Thanks, Chad. Oh, thank you. Thank you.